Hello and welcome to Letters Home, a story of a World War II B-17 pilot from Lowell, Michigan, in his own words. And he just so happens to be my grandpa. I'm your host, Annie Whitlock, and I'm joined by my co-host, my dad, Mitch McMahon, and my aunt, Lori Summerfield. In each episode of Letters Home, we're going to dive into letters written by my dad during his time in World War II that he sent to his parents, siblings, and friends back home in Lowell, Michigan. We'll be reading his own words and giving some context to what was happening in the world and in Lowell at the time he wrote those, or these. In this episode, we talk about some of Bruce's adventures in Southern California, his new St. Christopher's medal, and how those on the home front in Lowell are handling the war. All right. Uh, before we get into it today, as always, we have some corrections and additions for our segment. Uh, and today, I have something to add for once. Uh, if you remember back in episode four, we read a letter from Bruce to Frank, and he was talking about getting first place in the 75-yard and 150-yard dash at Santa Ana. And um, he wrote that the, the record would be in the paper, and I tried to find this paper, and I found out that it does exist, but only in person in Santa Ana, California, not available online. Well, I didn't give up, and I sent an email to the Costa Mesa Historical Society. This is how nerdy I've gotten with this project. And a lovely volunteer there named Mary Ellen Goddard wrote me back, and this is what she found. So I'm going to read you the email she sent me. She said, I checked fairly carefully, but did not find just what you wanted. However, for at least two months after the cadet newspaper began on July 2nd, 1942, the sports section had articles, cadets meet high physical standards, stating there have been a number of outstanding marks set by cadets, which warrant mentioning. If you considered your own accomplishments more or less remarkable, the following figures will convince you that there is still a little room for improvement. <laughs> Push-ups, 68. 75 yard dash, 7.3 seconds. 150 yard dash, 15.9 seconds. The above marks have all been made by Santa Ana cadets. So then Mary Ellen writes, your grandfather may well have been the one to set the record and his name was just not included. I could not find any articles in that time period where names were included. So, I mean, I'm very happy that Mary Ellen in Costa Mesa, California, has now taken an interest <laughs> in Grandpa's athletic records, but I actually went back to episode four and, and listened to it again, and the numbers that Bruce said he did are actually uh, slower <laughs> than what the record is. So apparently by the time the newspaper got around to publishing these, maybe his base record had already been broken. But this doesn't really add anything to the story. I was just... <laughs> very curious and it's been kind of fun to piece this Nerds together across america i know um and it was really i was just really happy to get a reply yeah, so i wanted to give them a great. shout out thank that you costa mesa great. historical society absolutely, absolutely. <laughs> uh, it's kind of fun and i know our regular guest dale croft has something to add about murray lake island so welcome dale glad you're here yep we're well, back again what'd you find it. out well we uh last episode was when bruce talked about Hopefully, Frank getting by in a lot on Murray Lake. He mm -hmm. brought up Murray Lake, I think, what, three times or yeah. more in our last yeah. podcast. So I thought our listeners might enjoy a little backstory about Murray Lake. Murray Lake is the largest of over 25 lakes in Granton Township and the third largest in Kent County at 320 acres. Murray Lake was given different names throughout its history. Lake names were Nagal, Horseshoe, Eng Eagle, and finally Murray, hmm. named after James Murray, whose family moved from New York to Michigan in 1848 and purchased a large tract of land alongside the lake. His Scottish descendants date back to the 13th century, one of which fought with William Wallace and Robert the oh. Bruce. All right. I got a Scottish warrior out there. <laughs> the north end of the island was a popular camping and picnic site along with a boat livery on Lally. On July 15, 1897, an article in the Belding Banner read, Keep cool through the hot weather by coming to the cool and pleasant grove where you will find tables, seats, stoves, and buildings free to all who rent boats. Boat rental is 20 cents a day or $1 a week to the campers. We will have a harvest picnic on the afternoon of July 28th with various games to make sport for young and old. Dances in the afternoon and evening. Oh, around, 19, around 1907, the Lally family purchased the land on the south end of the lake, and the lane that crossed their property from east to west is now the present Lally Road that we all travel out there. Yeah. 
One of the oldest buildings, it's probably the oldest building now, on the lake is the Lally House on the corner of Lally and Causeway Drive. The big, mm-hmm. And that's, that's the house that my great-grandfather and grandfather rented from Thomas Lally to farm the island and uh, the property around Murray Lake in the early 1900s. For many years, the peninsula that juts into the lake was an uninhabited island. During the summer, farmers transported their cattle by barge to graze. Later, filling in the shallow area with rocks and other debris, farmers were able to drive their livestock to the island, even though the path was sometimes covered with water. During the Depression, one of the WPA, or Workers' Progress Administration, projects was to build a road to the island, which is now known as Causeway Drive. Okay. So that kind of gives you a little, everybody, Andy kept going, an island, an island. What's <laughs> I had never, what I was island? like, what What's are they, an island? It, last I checked, there wasn't an island on Murray Lake, but apparently. <laughs> At one time there was. At one yeah. time there was. Yeah. So I have added uh, quite a few uh, old time pictures of Murray Lake uh, to our YouTube uh, presentation from uh, that episode. We have some pictures of the island when. There was very few trees on it, uh, a picture of the causeway that you can barely see land on, and some good old time people that lived there in the 20s with the old fashioned swimsuits, swimsuits on their docks <laughs> ready to go out. So, so um, it used to be a place for cows. Yeah. Boat, yeah. boat rental, 20 cents a day. Yeah. Nice. That's I a also deal. heard a story, one more quick story. I don't know if it's true or not, but the island has a piles of rocks on it. Just huge piles of rocks. I don't know what they came from. We thought maybe it might be Native Americans or something. Because there was a, a winter uh, village out in the winter. They would break up the Adawa to break up and move into winter camps. But what, what some old timer told me that um, they brought pigs on the island because there were snakes. And the pigs would eat the snakes. Oh, my gosh. For, for the cattle grazing because they were scared of snakes. So whether that's true or not, it could be an old... Old timer tale. Ooh, I don't it could know. Could be true. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, yeah. It's yeah. learning a lot about <laughs> yeah. about Lowell, about Murray Lake that I had no idea. This is great. Well, should we get into reading some letters? Sure. sure. <laughs> uh, the letters we're reading today are for from some of Bruce's last few days at Santa Ana. So he's seems like he's got some more free time to go out and explore Southern California. And so we're going to start with a letter from July 17th, 1942, in his own words. Friday night after show. Dear folks, it's 15 to 10, so I'll only start this. Just got back from the movie, my first in four weeks. I've tried to go a couple of times before, but something came up once, and the other time we couldn't get in. The picture tonight was, take a letter, darling, Fred McMurray and Roz Russell. It was one of the best shows I've seen in I don't know when. If you get the chance, don't miss it. Darn it, my clock's slow. There went the air, the warning whistle. So I'll say good night until tomorrow. He continues this letter the next day, and what he would do in his letters is he would draw these dashed lines to show that time had mm-hmm. passed. So if you wanted to just keep going on the same page. Um, so remember, you can see all of this uh, in Bruce's handwriting um, on the Lowell Historical Museum website um, and even in some of our uh, YouTube videos as well. So. It also in this, Dale found the movie poster from Take a Letter, Darling, and he kind of put that next to the letter on these uh, visual primary sources. Uh, has, any, has anyone seen this movie? I tried to stream it, but it's not available. I really did try. I was like, I could put this on in the background and see what this is all about, but I feel like it's lost for time. Okay. I found a short write-up about it. Tom Verney was Fred McMurray's name in the movie. He <laughs> plays a struggling painter who accepts a job as a secretary to A.M. McGregor, which was Rosalind Russell, a demanding advertising executive. Tom quickly realizes he is responsible for more than just mailing letters. Oh. He also expected to escort Russell and her friends to parties and restaurants and in an effort to shield them from unsavory advances. As they work hard to secure a lucrative tobacco account, their platonic relationship threatens to turn into something more. Ooh, (laughs) Now I really do want to see it. I know. I kind of want to see it. So it's like a, yeah, the the woman is the high-powered executive. Yeah, gender role reversal. Yeah, yeah, gender gender flip. Absolutely. Uh, It was nominated for some Oscars, I think, for like writing or something, but I couldn't find it anywhere. I don't know. What do you guys remember Fred McMurray for? Oh, uh, what was the TV show? Lubber? 
Oh, oh, my, my three sons. Okay. Yeah, yeah. My three sons. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I don't want to. I know. I don't want to say anything derogatory, but he didn't seem like he was going to be the love interest. But evidently, he is in this one. This yeah. the, and Ross Russell. Yes, she was. I, I totally understood that. But Fred McMurray. Hmm. All right. Well, I'm gonna take all your word for it. Um, <laughs> I don't know who any of these people are. <laughs> Yeah. So uh, this July 17th letter is the first to mention that he's leaving S-A-A-A-B the following week. And he also talks about getting in some final trips before he goes. So Aunt Lori, you want to keep going in his own words? We've had all our final tests. I've averaged 90 plus for all exams. This is pretty good considering I haven't had math or physics in the last 10 years. This weekend, if I get a pass, I'm going up to Lake Arrowhead with a friend of mine, Tom McKnight from Wisconsin. Arrowhead's 18 miles from San Bernardino, and San Bernardino is 52 from Santa Ana. Probably won't get there until after dark, but I want to get up early, look around a bit, go to church, and then head back here at about 10 o'clock. I've been receiving your letters very regularly, and if I don't answer all your questions, it's because I have to almost steal time to write. Therefore, I haven't had your letters with me, and I don't remember all your questions. I'm saving all the letters I've received and storing them in my footlocker. I'll repeat what a swell St. Christopher medal that, dad, that that was. Dad really shouldn't have bought such a good one, but now that I have it, you'll never get it away from me. And do we still do we still have that medal? I mean, Dale had a picture of it, well, so a, I don't know if you'd found it's a, a... It's a keychain. The one I have is a St. Christopher medal that is a keychain that mm -hmm. I had for from I, you guys. I'm okay. not sure. Oh, okay, yeah. so maybe, yeah. We did never got away could from it. It could be the one, could, <laughs> could not be the one. one. Yeah. Do we have the foot locker? I don't know what that would look like. That's not I, the I box that it, the letters come in, is it? I think maybe that's or what maybe he's it is. Re referencing. But I did a little research on the St. Christopher medal since I'm not um, remotely as religious as Grandpa Bruce or Great Grandpa Frank. Apparently, these medals offer safe travels and protection and also symbolize overcoming adversity and the courage to follow your destiny. Is that right? Because that's pretty cool. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I think that's awesome. Uh, definitely fitting for this I don't adventure. think we have time to go into the story of St. Christopher, but... All right. Well, <laughs> but I think that's very, uh, very appropriate, I guess, oh, like yeah. for this journey in war. Overcoming adversity, courage to follow your destiny, that yeah. pretty much reads like this entire story. So I read that and was like, I hope that's that's right, because it's perfect. And you had found something yeah, on Lake have, Arrowhead, I, right? I found, I found out some information on Lake Arrowhead. Uh, during the 40s, Lake Arrowhead was a popular destination for Hollywood celebrities and Southern Californians who enjoyed boating and relaxing on the lake. Their area was known as the Swiss Alps of Southern California. All right. And it was featured in the 1937 Laurel and Hardy movie, Swiss Miss. During the war, it was a quiet place for servicemen to rest and recuperate due to the fact that gas rationing kept tourists away. Oh. So that might be why you're... A lot of the surface mayor, Bruce, like to go up there. Just, that was quiet. Sure. Okay. Try to get in all those little day trips while yeah. I can. Yeah. Uh, so the rest of this letter gets into a little bit of war news and talks a little bit about Lowell. So it's time to get into our segment where we talk about what was going on in the world and in Lowell in late July 1942. Uh, so, Ann Laurie, why don't you keep us going in his own words? Here's something that ought to cheer you up to some degree. If I get through my training, I'm going to have a lot of trouble to keep from instructing. I was talking to our CO yesterday, and he said he didn't think they would let me go in, on bomber duty, even if I tried to get it. Said with my training, I'd be instructing. It'll be less hazardous, but not as interesting. Well, that's it. <laughs> I love that. Like, it's yeah. not as interesting. Yeah. Okay. Um, but we know he did eventually do bomber duty, oh, yeah. of course. So this didn't really happen. Um, but what would instructing entail? Like, what would a... He says it wouldn't have been as interesting, but does that well, mean he would have been in yeah. the United States? Did yeah. you find out? Yeah, anything yeah. It, it, it's basically a trial and training run for the actual bombing. Bomber duty for pilots involved flying the aircraft and coordinating the actions of crew members to ensure the plane reached its target, dropped its bombs, and returned safely to base. Pilots were considered the most important crew member and were responsible for the safety and efficiency of the entire crew, not just during flight. Okay. They had to kind of keep an eye on them afterwards, too. Hmm. A bomber crew was made up of specialists, each with their own role. Other crew members included co-pilot, which had to be able to take over and act as a pilot at any time. The bombardier. Mm -hmm. Got it. Operated the Norton 
uh, bomb sight to switch it on, fix the crosshairs on the target, and make course corrections and determine release of bombs. The navigator had to direct the flight from departure to destination and return. He had to know the exact position of the airplane at all times. Engineer was the chief source of information concerning the airplane. He had to know more about the equipment than any other crew member, including the pilot. Radio worked with a navigator using various radio aids to determine position. Gunners typically made up half of the bomber crew, operating the guns in the top turret, ball turret, two waist guns, and tail turret that defended the bomber from German inceptors from, during air-to-air -air combat. The ball turret gunner protected the bomber from below by manning the ball turret in a cramped fetal position, which Ugh. I can't imagine anybody uh, Jeez. Okay. watch Masters of the Air or those guys in the bottom. Uh, the engineer typically operated the upper turret, working closely with the pilot and co-pilot to check systems and troubleshoot malfunctions. The tail gunner protected the rear of the bomber from attack. Two waist gunners provided protection on the sides of the B-17. Gunners used a defensive technique called Loofberry Circle, very interesting, where each gunner was assigned a certain area to cover based on the plane's position in the formation. This allowed the formation to present a large amount of firepower to an attack without gunners having to move their guns more than a few degrees. Mm. Bomber crews served a defined tour of duty, 25 missions, this policy contrasted with other combat arms where troops served for the duration of the war. While airmen faced significant risks during the tours and had a higher casualty rate than the other combat arms, having a defined endpoint to their service provided a sense of certainty and a goal to work. Mm. So that's what your dad did and grandfather did. Um, he was on bomber duty. He was responsible for this, what, everything that I just read, all of that. So instructing would be teaching people how to do all that? Yeah, so that's what stay they behind? wanted him to. Okay. Yeah. But clearly they needed I, people. I think so. I came across a letter where he said he'd be doing it in Michigan. I remember one of the letters. Yeah, but. yeah I thought he said something about even going back yeah. to Grand Rapids or whatever yeah. and instructing, mm -hmm. but and it did not happen. Yeah. <laughs> remember, he flew 38 missions, not 25, too. Yeah, so. went a little extra, yeah. for sure. Yeah. Well, he does go on to talk about um, people back home in Lowell and how they must be handling the war. So in his own words. I suppose things are sort of quiet around Lowell this summer. No showboat, etc. This army isn't exactly a family picnic, but it certainly is better than living at home under the conditions that some are at home. I've never been a sorry a moment that I got here. And when it's over with, I'll be able to look townspeople square in the eye. <laughs> That's interesting. So. Do you think he was, I mean, he seems very proud, obviously, to be, to be serving. Um, we know there were a lot of people in Lowell, a lot of men in Lowell that did serve. Um, but this part about looking the townspeople in the eye, there's some sort of, like, pride of being back home. Like, and it, was he just, like, glad he wasn't dismissed for health reasons? Is he, you know, trying to take a shot at people that didn't serve? Like, I couldn't know what he, what he means here. I don't know if we want to guess, but... Yeah, and I'm not sure either, but it's, it's, you know, yeah, definitely proud. And, you know, I guess you want to be making sure that you're doing your part and maybe thinking that there were others that didn't, but mm -hmm. yeah. I'm like, yeah, maybe they're not, yeah, they may feel guilty for not serving or something, but he's feeling proud. I don't know. It's a really well, interesting he, he way to phrase it. I wondered, would he have washed out entirely if uh, he had, hadn't uh, passed the eye exam or would yeah. he, or he just washed out of the, the, the air corps? So I wasn't, I'm not quite sure about that. But. I don't know. That's a good point. I don't know. All right, let's finish this long letter with some family news. My time is up again, so I'll close. If you want to know about my new place, ask me questions, and I'll try to answer them when I get there. All my love, your loving son, Jay Bruce. P.S. I think it's well about Veda. It'll give you something else to think about, Not, but hopefully not to worry about, I hope. <laughs> Golly jeepers! I'm having, I'm struggling today with his, with his words. Yeah. Well, he does. We talked about this before we started recording. Like he does phrase things really differently, and I don't know if that's Grandpa's style of talking, or if that's 1942 style of talking, and that's how everybody talked, or well, and, or and what? Because right, he does sort of rearrange some yeah, words. Yeah, and in letters too. I think it's maybe different, but yeah. Oh, maybe, maybe. But anyway, we should probably tell people who Veda is. 
<laughs> so last episode we talked about his siblings. Um, so yeah, Dad, Aunt Laurie, you want to tell who Veda is and what you think was the big news? We're, we're guessing that Veda is pregnant. She's she was married to Roger. Um, uh, Bruce's brother. Bruce's brother, and we and we know that there was there's Gail and Frank. Mm -hmm. but we don't know who exactly which one this is a 42 we 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 should be able to figure that one out but yeah and it, it sounds like possibly that we think that that's what it is but it, it could be something else. yeah it too. could be <laughs> we're not sure i'm right. not sure i know we've been trying to think about what would you want to not worry about but be happy about like to take your mind off of things like that good sounds news. like a baby to me sounds that's like a baby sure. to me yeah. for sure something else to think about but not to worry about i hope yeah hmm. all right so beta was bruce's sister-in-law yep all right and he she comes up a lot um in other letters uh, along with burns wife helen so his other sister-in-law mm -hmm. and then who is marion married to oh goodness. we all don't know i'm oh, sorry i didn't mean to pop quiz you right now <laughs> oh, to look it up <laughs> the looks on her face is like oh no i thought maybe you would know well, I, I but that's fine that's i don't fine. remember marion at all so. Yeah, she, I mean, we, yeah, we did establish she was quite a bit older. Yeah. Than and I don't remember sure. Charlie, although others do, but I, I remember Jim. Okay. So. I, I didn't know there were <laughs> how many there were <laughs> so we're, <laughs> until we done to start doing this podcast. We're discovering, yeah, aunts, uncles, cousins that we didn't know about on this podcast. That's been fun. All right. Well, so we think we know what's happening with Veda. Maybe another family mystery to add yeah. um, eventually. <laughs> Spoiler alert, we could probably figure it out, though. Yeah, so somebody else should help us. Somebody else help us out with that <laughs> it's one. It's not that much of a mystery. All right, we're going to read this next letter in full. It's one that Bruce wrote to Lada on July 29th, 1942. And, Dad, you can take this one. So, in his own words. Wednesday night, 8.30. Dear Mother, received your letter today. Yes, maybe I've lost a few of my introversions, though, mind you, this army won't change me as much as you think. Maybe I'll look a bit older maybe change a few of my viewpoints on life, etc. But I'm still Bruce, though no one calls me Bruce, it's Jim. It's rather strange, but there is so little time to, to think in here that the future just isn't. The past has a habit of associating itself with some of the day's trials in here, but it's only momentary, and, and then it's back to the job at hand. I'm indebted to the Army for making me realize what I possessed before. Also that, and this was always your theory, it's the simple pleasures which go toward a contented life. One realizes that generations before us had to do some fighting to maintain our American way. Therefore, it's only fair to expect that we should also. This war may last uh, a long time and it may be over, uh, sh over with shortly. Only God knows the answer. And you know, he usually doesn't, he does things for the best. Therein lies our hope. I realize how tough this year is on you people at home. The fact is, when things get a bit rugged here in camp, I say to myself, isn't it so much better that you are the one who is away and you don't have to worry about someone away from home? That's why, or at least one of the reasons why, I don't want Raj in here. He's doing his part at home, one as equally important as he could ever do in here. Don't worry about me getting married. It was only something I happened to be thinking about at the time. If I spent 27 years looking, you might know I won't find anything now, perhaps when this is over. But uh, you must get over the idea that I keep things from you. I want you to know everything that happens to me. Why shouldn't I? I know you can take it. And you have a right to know, so quit being a worrier. Tell Byrne I'll send back a flock of pictures next week, uh, next week when I have time to get down to the post office. I also have some shots that I sent to the developers yesterday. I had fun at Balboa, but it didn't seem much like the 4th of July. I swam in the ocean and danced at night. The reason I don't write about all my doings is because I don't have to time. I'll write Saturday. Till then, all my love, J. Bruce. P.S. Dad's medal was so ultra, ultra, sw ultra swell. He shouldn't have spent so much on it. <laughs> he really loves that medal. Uh, I, we do have one of those shots that Bruce sent from Balboa. It's a picture of him and his friend Chuck Smith, and we know that this is from that trip because it was in his scrapbook and labeled as that. So, <laughs> But, um, thanks to Grandpa Bruce for making some of these things a lot easier on us. Uh, this is on the museum website, and we will put it on our Instagram and um, in our YouTube video for this episode, so you can actually see some of his good time at Balboa. 
Um, but what do you all think about this letter? He talks about being introverted, not being changed by war, getting married again. Like, there's a lot in here. The but future just, just isn't. I love Ooh. that. <laughs> it's like, whoa. I just, I just, whoa. <laughs> I love that. That's insanely poetic to yeah. me. Like, that's really, really just, interesting. Yeah. He okay. does seem to be able to, to, to articulate his feelings. That's yeah. More than I ever would have guessed, you know. Knowing Bruce after the war, it's hard to believe he was an introvert at one time. Mm -hmm. You know, he was always outgoing. Yeah. And, you know, he was always full of energy. So yeah. Maybe the war did change him, and he, despite him saying that it didn't, or it wasn't going to. I like that it's the simple pleasures that go towards a contented oh. life. Absolutely. Yeah. We forget that. What yeah. We, forget we should that. get that, like, on a T-shirt. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> like, I feel like I need to remember that. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, um, she was stopping at the kitchen candy. Simple pleasures. Yeah. Yeah, that's, that's true. true. That's I, yeah. I agree with you, Dad. That that future just isn't. It's not a bad T-shirt either. That's the not either. Isn't. I know. Yeah. The future just isn't. I mean, it's, it's a little depressing. The... But I think what he meant by it is, yeah, is that he's just stay forced, in the moment. Right? He's forced to stay in the moment. Yeah. He doesn't have time to worry about the future. I guess like yep. it just isn't isn't there, or even worry about the past all that much. It's just very mindful but yeah when you read it just by itself in context of a war it seems very depressing but um but i don't think that's how he meant no. it i just no. yeah that's this letter was just really quite interesting it tells you a lot about about grandpa but maybe the side of him you guys didn't, didn't know or didn't see um generations before us had to do some fighting to maintain our american way therefore it's only fair yeah. to expect that we should also mm -hmm. i think mm -hmm. that's really cool too absolutely yeah all right, well, we're going to finish today with part of one more letter that Bruce wrote to his parents on August 1st, 1942. So in his own words. Last night at a ballroom in Fresno, I ran into Kent Campbell, my instructor in Detroit. He was sure, surely surprised to see me and couldn't figure out how I got into the Air Corps. I told him about my exam at Grand Rapids and then the tough one I beat at Santa Ana. He's instructing in the Army at Lancaster Field, and he said he might fly in here and visit me before I go out of here again. It sure beats all how many people you run into, even this far away from home. He told me I wouldn't get another physical until I enter basic. Well, I'm taking B vitamin every day, and I think, it'll make it, uh, I think I'll make it. The bad part of this country is the bright sunlight. I wear colored glasses continually and save my eyes every chance I get. Last Thursday, I went on sit call uh, after athletics to get some iodine on a scrub knee. Soil is so alkaline, you have to disinfect any open cuts to prevent infection. When I was in there, the MD slapped a Schneider test on me and I was scared to death he might give me an eye exam, but he didn't. Boy, did I go out of there with my knees acting like <laughs> castanets. <laughs> it's a cinch that I won't ever try to gold brick by going on sick call. Some of them do that, you know. <laughs> Okay, so great. He's, he's really worried about that eye exam. Yeah. That, just his knees acting like castanets. Yeah, that's pretty good too. I, I do know, I do hear him say it's a cinch all the time. I think he means like it's obvious easy. or it's easy. easy. It's a cinch easy. that it's I won't cinch. ever try to, it's that I won't cinch. try to do it. It's easy, yeah. Apparently some people would pretend they were sick to get a little break yeah. and go on the sick call, but. Gold, gold brick. He's not going to do that not because he's gold. very afraid of having to yeah. get that eye exam. He really is. He's taking oh. those vitamin B. Yeah, so his old flight instructor was amazed that he cheated and or passed yeah. all of these eye exams. So clearly, this has been on Bruce's mind a lot. So, But I had no idea what the Schneider test is. <laughs> so, Dale, do you know? I gave you a little homework. Well, well, what do after, you think? After we, I tell you what the Schneider test was, I think we'll understand why his knees were acting like castanets. Uh -oh, no. oh, oh, no. Oh, no. Oh, no. <laughs> well, the Schneider test was a standard part of the day be flight physical. This exam measured circulatory efficiency by taking blood pressure and pulse readings three times while the applicant was reclining, standing after exercise. The applicant also stepped up and down on a stool 10 times. The results were entered in a chart to produce the number. So that's what he did. Okay. It's like he a cardio. Up and down, up and down. Oh my God. That. So <laughs> he walked out of there with his knees acting like castanets. <laughs> That makes sense. From all the stepping and he, in and running. he was worried about an eye exam. Yeah. <laughs> oh my gosh. Yeah. So he goes in there for a skin knee. They do all this cardio test on him, but he's wor all he's worried about are his eyes. Oh. He's got to wear sunglasses because it's too sunny <laughs> in California. 
Oh my goodness! Tell us a lot about. Yeah, he Bruce he did. really wanted to fly. That's for sure. He really oh did. Gosh, yes. Yeah. He yeah. really really did. Uh, well, that's a good place to stop for today. Um, in our next episode, Bruce goes to primary at Rankin Field in Tulare, California. So we are leaving Santa Ana Army Air Base. So I'm gonna say goodbye to Santa Ana and hello to Tulare, California. So thank you for listening to Letters Home. We hope you continue to listen as we go through Bruce's story. You can listen to Letters Home on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, or the Lowell Historical Museum website and YouTube channel. New episodes drop every Thursday. The Lowell Historical Museum has digitized versions of Bruce's letters, so you can read them in full, along with primary sources for most of the people, places, and events we've talked about here today, plus more. You can also follow the Lowell Historical Museum on Facebook and the Letters Home podcast on Instagram at Letters Home Lowell. Thank you to Roger McNaughton for our podcast music and to WRWW 92.3 FM for letting us record in their studio at Lowell High School every week. Tune in or stream WRWW at LowellRadio.org. See you next time.